Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Very good afternoon to all of you. It's been really a great pleasure and honor to participate in this evaluation. And with the team, uh, my colleagues on the team, we've learned a lot and seen so many exciting things. I, I hope you will stay awake because it's always challenging to make a presentation right after lunch. I'm reminded of my old days as a professor back in my country, Morocco. Well, one afternoon like this, right after lunch, I had to teach. And uh, after some while, I realized that one of my students had fallen asleep. Um, but the worst thing is that he was also snoring. Uh, so I discreetly tried to tell his neighbor, can you please wake him up? But his neighbor said, professor, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> so I'll try to keep you awake. I would like to imagine, you to imagine three pictures. First one in Vietnam. In this university, we met this nursing professor who was so excited because she had been acquiring relevant knowledge from Nepal through the project, the NSS project with Finland. In Kenya, we were so impressed by these forestry students who had designed a video game in partnership with IT students to motivate primary and secondary school children towards forestry studies. And in South Africa, we were invited to witness the projection of the final project of three teams of students who had done documentaries on socially relevant issues. And each team had a mix of Finnish, South African, and Ghanaian students, and that was really inspiring. And these are just three examples among the many, many positive stories that we were able to see as we visited your partner institutions in these three countries. And this helped us build a, a global image to make a synthesis of the evaluation that we're going to present this afternoon. So the presentation is divided into three parts. I want to say a few words about the methodology and how the evaluation was conducted first, and then synthesize the main findings and conclusions, and finally offer some recommendations. And I will try, for the interest of time, I will try to go very fast, or so maybe not show all the slides or all the points, and then during the discussion, we can go into much more depth if you have specific concerns or questions. This evaluation was conducted in four steps. We started with a desk study of existing documents, and then we had a series of visits with many of you here. And at this point, I want to thank you all because in Finland and then with your partners in the three countries and with the Finnish embassies, we had only positive meetings. Everybody was very open, very constructive, very helpful, and without your help, we couldn't have carried out this evaluation. That doesn't mean that if there are any mistakes or errors of interpretation, that's, it's still our responsibility, of course. And the third step was to conduct field visits the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for, for Foreign Affairs had asked us to go to three countries, Vietnam, Kenya, and South Africa. And then, of course, we sat down and tried to summarize everything we learned during these visits and the desk study. The team, um, <clears throat> we had a mixed team with two Finnish experts who are here with us, uh, Mr. Yuho, Usi Hakala, it took me a few weeks to pronounce, learn to pronounce properly uh, Yuho's name. Uh, he's, he's, in a way, he's one of you on both sides. He's worked as an independent consultant, but also as a member of the ministry, and he was in two embassies, uh, so a lot of experience. And Ms. Kira Kerkainen, who has also both experience in Finland and internationally, including with the OECD in Paris. Um, the third member, unfortunately, could not be with us today, Mrs. Hena Mukherjee from Malaysia, who has very extensive international experience, including with the Association of Commonwealth Universities and the World Bank. And uh, myself, I've 
been working for 20, 20 odd years on high education issues, a long time with the World Bank, and I've, I'm, I feel that I'm so privileged because the, my career took me to, I guess, around 90 countries now working on high education reform. Uh, the desk study uh, focused on three levels of analysis, qualitative analysis of a lot of policy documents on the international aid framework, Finnish development policy, uh, experience of other donor, donors, especially the other Nordic countries and the Netherlands. And then we did an in-depth qualitative and quantitative analysis of both NSS and Heike programs. And finally, we selected a sample and did a very thorough qualitative analysis based on the documents. And then we had, as some of you know, the first week of February, we had an intensive series of meetings in Finland with the official partners, MFA and CIMO, Ministry of Education, Arini, Samok, SIL, UNIPID, the Academy of Finland, TECES, and a large sample of universities. We also had meeting with the uh, project coordinators, which was very useful. In, in total, we covered in our visits 20 projects, seven Heike and 13 NSS. And then we went to the other side. We first went to Vietnam, where we were able to visit seven projects in 11 universities, and these represented all the, NS, uh, the high Heike project in Vietnam and 85% of the NSS projects. Then we took a break and continued our trip. We combined Kenya and South Africa, first Kenya, again 11 projects, five universities in four different places, representing all Heike projects in the country and 80% of the NSS projects. Finally, nine projects in South Africa in, at un, eight universities in three places, 65% of all NSS and half, actually half of the two Heike projects are going on in that country. So what did we find and what could we conclude based on these visits? Uh, first, we asked the question of how do these projects start? And as happens with many partnerships, not only in Finland, is that it's very often on an ad hoc basis. Typically, one of your former students or a colleague, uh, like you want to continue working together, and that's so personal contact, individual meetings, um, etc. But so the, the main point is that the choice of partners is not necessarily based on strategic considerations. And as a result, the policy alignment is not always very big. Uh, with Finnish policy, development policy generally, but what perhaps what was more of concern is that there was not always full alignment with what your government is doing in the various countries. So sometimes, yes, it corresponded to the priorities, but sometimes the embassy would tell us, here are our priorities, but the projects were in different areas. And the projects, generally speaking, are developed through mechanisms that do not take into consideration what else Finland is doing in a given country. Now, there were, of course, you know, these are the general conclusions, but at some point, you know, each time there may be some exception. We find the Eldoret, at Eldoret University in Kenya, uh, they had benefited from an MMB, MMMB project that paved the way for the um, Heike project. Uh, now, this being said, that doesn't mean that the projects are not good, that they are not relevant, and in fact, they are certainly always aligned with the high education development needs of the countries. But it just, you know, it, it's good, it happens, but not necessarily in a coordinated fashion. We also realize that in many cases, the, minister, the local ministries of higher education were not necessarily aware of what was going on. How do partners work together? Even when you have several Finnish teams in one country, or sometimes even in one university, lack of coordination was the rule more than the exception. Uh, 
Uh, we've seen, in some cases, a university that had several projects with Finland, or even in one case, several projects with the same university in Finland. But in that university, they were not aware of each other. Mind you, in some cases, even in Finland, we've also seen at the same university, you had projects, sim different teams working with the same university in a partner country, not necessarily well coordinated. Large universities in your partner countries usually have many, many partners. So, as a result, the relationship with Finland is just one among many, and it's not always, or more often than not, it's not the best resourced. On the other hand, and this explains why we made one of our recommendations, which I know is a bit controversial with some of you, is that we said that um, we found that when we went to outside the capital city, in rural areas or in small cities, or when we went to small departments of universities, there the Finnish partnerships made a big difference in terms of mobility with NSS, in terms of curriculum development, or establishment of new programs through HEIKI. In South Africa, for example, we realized that even 20 years after the end of apartheid, they are still quite isolated. So your partnerships were um, quite, uh, re were regarded quite highly in that context. Some of our findings, NSS in terms of student mobility, we've met with so many students who told us stories that almost brought us tears. You know, they were so moving. We, we could see for that individual, uh, if you remember, you know, University of Nair in the musical department, these young ladies who had gone to Finland and came back empowered, transformed. Their life will never be the same as a result of NSS. But the numbers, when you look at the numbers, you're talking one, two, maximum three students who go for three months, or equally small numbers of Finnish students who travel to these countries. And what is, to us, we, we saw as a concern is that these very nice things where that happened, happened in isolation. It's with one professor, a few students, but that doesn't necessarily tie with the institutional building needs or objectives of the higher education institution in question. In the case of Vietnam, there were, we, we, we talk in our report about something that I call enabling conditions. Something that has to do with either the national environment or the institutional environment that impacts on the project. Just to one first example here, in Vietnam, some of the students didn't have the level of English needed to take really advantage of their participation in the project. On teacher mobility, here again the numbers are quite small. The duration is also very short. Uh, for the f partner teachers coming to Finland, it would be one week, two weeks max. This being said, they still valued and found the experience very uh, satisfying and very relevant, very useful. They all appreciated your visits to their institutions, but on, in general there was the feeling that these visits were too short, um, especially when it's the first time you have to understand, uh, know, learn to know a, the new, a new complex and sometimes challenging environment. And again, the impact is limited most of the times to one unit within a department or to one department, and the rest of the university is untouched. We didn't see much of it, but sometimes we saw some academic tourism uh, on both sides. Uh, some professors who went to Finland, the project, the program was not really structured, and some Finnish professors who were rewarded by a trip to South Africa or somewhere else. Of the three activities, student mobility, teacher mobility, the intensive courses came out as the most meaningful 
activity. Even though it's labor intensive to prepare, there is no administrative uh, remuneration to take care of that, but everybody spoke highly of these courses. That's how you can reach large numbers of participants. And here is one of the very positive features, the South-South dimension that few donors do have in their programs. And I really want to congratulate you from that. Um, but again, many of these courses were of very short duration. And in some cases, because of the many partners involved, we saw that undergraduate students and graduate students will be mixed together. And that was not very uh, f functional. Now, when I share our results on Haiti, I want to clarify, as you know, the Haiti program is very young. So our conclusions are really can have to be seen as preliminary conclusions. We saw many relevant activities taking place. Curriculum development, staff development, introduction of modern pedagogical practices, uh, etc. And when the team was well organized, when there was strong institutional oversight, we, we saw very good implementation of the project. Uh, and some good practices when you had purchase of equipment complementing the other soft activities that were being carried out. And some universities, some of your partners, really trying to build synergies by using, combining NSS and Heike or other of their activities. We mentioned a few examples in the, in the report. And in that case, it was really, you could see a bigger impact. Uh, capitalizing on the strengths of both the Finnish and the local team for curriculum development, where both sides learn together. Um, some Finnish partners saying, hey, what we've done together in your country is, uh, is very good, very relevant. Let's take it back and transform our curriculum back in, in Finland. Uh, some institutions were first studying the local labor market to see which kind of programs, new programs they needed to, development, uh, to develop, combining students from different uh, disciplines and areas to find solutions to local program, problems, and an increasing focus on changing pedagogical practices, making them more interactive and collaborative. The Heike projects, much more than the NSS, tended to have a good monitoring framework. But, um, and again, that may be linked to the fact that it's so young, they are so young in their implementation, not using the results yet in a very effective manner. Some concerns started to, to see that here again, the projects were not well, always well integrated in the, into the overall strategic plan or direction of the high education institutions. So sometimes we've, we saw very good activities. Sometimes they were leading edge, pioneer work. We could see this is the first time that this is happening in the country. But there was no recognition by the leadership of that institution. And as a result, the, your partners felt very miserable about it. The, one of the challenges at your end, we see that you, know, you are all very busy with your various activities, programs, and so as a result, the activities in the partner countries have to fit your schedule, and sometimes that was a little bit disruptive. For example, we saw a, a, a pilot course that was supposed to take a month to be delivered, but had to be fit into one week because of some constraints with the Finnish partners. And key projects, as we know, have a different administrative process than NSS, and in many cases it was felt that it was a much more cumbersome um, program and, than the uh, NSS. In conclusion, again, you know, saying and finding that all these activities are very relevant, are very positive, most of the time they are carried out in an in a, in a effective manner, but when you take it as a whole, because remember our project, our mission was not to evaluate individual projects, but to look at both programs. 
we felt that there is a lack of critical mass overall. Small numbers in the exchange programs, larger numbers for the intensive course, but um, the impact still in terms of capacity building, which was our main preoccupation, was limited. Uh, again, some projects worked very well. NSS project where you had several cycles, there the impact was much bigger because they were able to build there, they were able to build more capacity. The, as I mentioned, the South-South exchanges are seen as a very positive feature, but it's very limited uh, what they can do in terms of South-South. It's only for the organization of the intensive courses. And the, as I mentioned with my first example from Vietnam, in some cases, because of the similarities of problems, learning from Nepal for Vietnam was more relevant than learning from Finland. So bringing, offering more opportunities there would be very important. And in a way, we, we, we feel that there is a policy decision that has to be thought through. What is the main aim of an NSS project? If it's seen as a mobilization, internationalization, for, then yes, it's performing its function. If the capacity building dimension is to be taken seriously, there, there are serious limitations. And the fact that the assessment framework is not built strongly into the program also limits the evaluation of the results of the impact. On HEIKI, again, highly relevant activities to local and national needs, but to measure impact was very difficult for lack of information. The capacity building of academics has been seen as very useful, curriculum reform, curriculum design. Not always are your resources used very effectively. Again, not because you don't want to, but because the enabling conditions in the partner institutions may not be there. Something as simple as the length of opening of libraries in public universities where you know, they will close at 5 p.m. and so your resources, your very useful resources may not always be in use. So our general conclusion is that on the one hand, each project or most of the projects taken individually are useful, are effective, the South-South dimension is very relevant, and your partners are really grateful and appreciate. And it's not just because you, you come and you give them resources, you help them. There is something about relationship, I would say, with Nordic countries in general, with Finland in particular, that they appreciate better than with some other countries. You don't come with a colonial past. You don't come with arrogance. You are down to earth, very genuinely trying to help. I'm not trying to be polite, but I, you know, I, I, I see many donors, and this is something that... Uh, characterizes your, um, your assistance, which you should be happy about because they, they realize that they can trust you, that you have no other motives than, than just helping. Now we need to put things in perspective. What you contribute in terms of finance is very small. You know. In the three countries where we did field visits, for example, the Finnish aid in for higher education, these are the total aid disbursements, and Finnish aid for higher education was less than half of, a person, of 1%. It's, it's very small. The average Heike budget is 275,000 euros. It's less than 50,000 for NSS. And when you calculate what ends up with the local partner, it's on average uh, 6,500 6, euros. Um, and you are working in, with many partners, you are working in 25 different countries, so there is a risk that your resources, already limited globally, will be spread very thinly across many, many partner institutions. Um, the make, as a result, we feel that the make, there is no mechanism to, to, to ensure that there is proper coordination for implementing. So you have limited resources, and then in one given country, you may be working with several partners, 
but not taking advantage of possible synergies. Huh? We've already mentioned the issue of size and then duration. You know better than me that to build capacity takes time. Let's say if you want to establish a new program, you will, it will take at least two years to design the new program, the, the new curriculum, but to train the academics who will be able to teach, that's going to take maybe four years, maybe five years, and then to see the results are going to take another two, three, four years. So if I remember correctly, the first cycle of Heike was 18 months. Capacity building takes six, seven, ten years. So long-term vision is very important. And then, you know, mobility, curriculum reform, but building capacity takes more than that. Unanimously, your partners wished that the funding would also include research, joint research, that the funding would include scholarships for the training of the academics who need to get a master or a PhD. That's also a very important part of capacity building, which is not part of either NSS or HIC. And then, overall, there is a mixed performance of projects. Some are doing very well, some are not doing so well. And what worried us is to see that we asked the question, who is monitoring? And who is, when there is a problem, who has the responsibility for taking action, for signaling? You know, you all, there are reports that are produced and CMO receive them, but what, what then? And in a few cases, we saw partnerships where there were significant problems. And they were not from last month. They had been going on for many years. But somehow, it didn't come out in the report. It didn't come out. And nobody went there to see, to seek to identify this problem. So we feel that defining much better the responsibility for monitoring, which in theory is we see more, but uh, what role what resources does CIMO have for that? What role do the, the embassies play? Your poor colleagues in the embassy are overstretched. Very few people, lots of work, uh, and they don't have this specific responsibility. And we, one of the big surprises and challenges for us was to see that the CIMO database for both NSS was, let's say, not the best possible instrument to analyze or to keep track of what was going on. Remember I spoke about enabling conditions? It's important to make sure when you design a project or implement that it is aligned with what I call country systems. Just one example. One project in Vietnam, you were doing great work changing the curriculum. But then in Vietnam, the Central Ministry of Education is in charge of exams. Now, academics know that Exams are part of the curriculum. So if you change the curriculum, you need also to change the way you assess what the students have learned. But if you don't control that, it's a problem. Um, South Africa has a different academic year from Finland or from the rest of the, from many other countries. That also created problems of programming at the right time. Same thing about enabling conditions within institutions. As I mentioned, sometimes there was lack of ownership by the overall institution. It was not part of the strategic plan, so there was no support to the partnership. Or again, a project, I think it was in Kenya, where good, a new pro curriculum had been changed. But that university has so lengthy procedures to revise curriculum. So the curriculum was ready, but they could not use it because the Senate had not uh, gone through it. So where do we go from that? I think the most important part is what do we learn from that in terms of and make recommendations? We propose as a general principle, starting from the observation that your resources for development cooperation, for higher education, are limited. So make sure that they are well used, well concentrated. So concentration and strategic vision should be the guiding principles if you want to have greater results, deeper impact. And how do you apply the principle? We suggest that you don't continue with two different instruments, 
but that you have a more comprehensive instrument and that you select, you be both selective on fewer countries. On paper, you have priority countries, but in reality, the projects are all over the geographical map. And we feel that you should try to select as partners those institutions where capacity building needs are greater. So what does it mean concretely? All the activities that are done now separately, mobility, curriculum reform, pedagogical, new pedagogical practices, they should all happen in one type of project because each one of them is needed. And open up to these other activities that are missing, joint research and scholarships for master or PhD. For those academies, not, we're not talking about a general scholarship project for any Kenyan or Vietnamese or South Africa. No, scholarships, if you have an integrated project to help one institution, partner institution, then for the training of the new professors, that's what it should be used for. And then try to have instruments that go for the longer term so that you can really build and see the results over several years. Don't forget when you design a project to think about the enabling conditions. You know. If in the country you're working, English mastery is a problem, then build that into the program, either by selecting students or professors who are ready or by helping them improve their language mastery. Now, the, I know, and we, we can come back to the discussion, we feel that if you really want to have impact, try to work with institutions that need you more. Um, working with younger or weaker institutions in the provinces where you will really see a difference after you work with them. And that doesn't need to mean that you forget completely the more established university in the capital city. But you could have a tri tri triangle where you work in partnership with a strong university and you help either together or through the local strong university, the weaker universities. And we already have, you ha already have such examples as we could see, for, in, for instance, in Vietnam. Let me illustrate that. University of Nairobi, where you have several activities. Um, you know, it's, it's a huge university, it's a well-established. The question I ask you, if all of a sudden the existing partnerships with Finland cease, do you think University of Nairobi will notice? I mean, a few people will. But the institution is going to be fine. But University of Eastern Africa, Balaton, you are making a huge difference there. If you walk out tomorrow, they will not collapse, but they will hurt. And inversely, when you choose your future partners, if you take a partner where a lot has to be done, or you're creating a new department, a new faculty from scratch that is very relevant to local needs, you will make a big difference. You will not be one among 68 partnerships. So that's why we make this recommendation about focus. And then let's find ways to work together when there are several Finnish projects, several Finnish partners in one country or sometimes in one institution. Let us coordinate. And here we suggested something very simple. Let's have at least a yearly meeting of the Finnish embassy of all the projects that are funded by Finland. And that way you can identify possible synergies, complementarities, people realizing, oh, we are working, oh, we could do this. It, it, it could be very effective. And also work with your counterparts, ministries in charge of higher education in the partner country. Now, of course, and I think hopefully everybody will agree with us, this recommendation that if more resources can be given to high, high education cooperation, your impact will, is likely to be higher. And then let's make sure that in the future, the monitoring and evaluation framework is thought through in the design phase already and then all through the implementation phases. So that MFA and CIMO needs to work together to 
to have a, a strong monitoring template and then make sure that it's, it's used and that you have supervision mechanisms. So in the few cases where things are not going well, that this can be picked up early on and corrective actions can be taken. We overall, everybody was generally satisfied or very happy with CMO's administrative work. So we see no reason why it shouldn't come with the exception of the database management that, uh, as we know, CMO is aware of and, and uh, could be working on. Um, there were some, we're making a recommendation about the role of the steering committee. Uh, your institutions were not always clear why some of proje the projects were accepted, some were rejected. So uh, the mechanism needs to be revisited, more transparency in sharing the results of the evaluation, um, publishing the scores so that everybody understands um, why, why this is so. Uh, last uh, conclusion that we made or recommendation is that you, there is a lot of similarity in the objectives, in the motivations of the Nordic, the four Nordic countries. Why don't you try to work together? You don't always have an embassy in all the countries. Why don't you have the one country taking the lead in one partner country and then you work together? So the Finnish embassy could represent all Nordic countries in, in Kenya, for example, uh, while the Nor Norwegians would represent you in another country, etc. Uh, so you could pool your project resources, your administrative resources, uh, and uh, be much more effective. I think this is a great opportunity with this evaluation to think carefully about your vision for the future of development cooperation. Because uh, it's very important to know where, what you want to achieve. The, we've asked a few questions. I think hopefully you can use this evaluation to start answering them. Um, let's remember the wise words of the Roman philosopher Seneca, who told us more than 2,000 years ago that there is no favorable wind for those who don't know where they are going.